Welcome to the video on Catullus 13. So what we'll do here is uh, I'll, I'll have sections of the poem up uh, in order and I'll explain the grammar. I'll uh, talk about how we get to the translation and I'll of course say the translation out loud. And then we'll talk a little bit at the end of the video about why uh, this is an interesting poem and what we learned from it uh, historically and a little bit uh, maybe about uh, lyric poetry in Latin. Um, so anyway, this is uh, Catullus 13. It starts off with uh, Cannabis ben in me favore apud me. Pauci si tibi di favent diebus. Si tecum atuleris a bonam at quodat magnam cenam. Uh, non sine candida puella et vino et sale et omnibus cacinis. Um, so pretty famous uh, poem here uh, from Catullus. Um, Starting off, uh, you you might uh, actually hear it referred to this uh, with this future tense, this right here. Uh, you will dine well, okay? Uh, so cannabis uh, bene, you will dine well, and then of course, uh, like we have at a lot of the beginning of poems, a vocative up here, uh, mi fabule, and you know it's uh, vocative because of the e ending on a second declension noun, uh, proper name fabolus. Um, and uh, that E ending is not usually in the second declension, and therefore you have to think outside the box a little bit and think vocative. So it's like my dear uh, Fabolus. Um, and then you get apud me. Now apud me is a nice preposition. Uh, if you look it up, you might see it means like near, but in this case, it kind of means the equivalent of like a French, like che, like at my house. Uh, so you will dine well, my Fabolus, at my house. Uh, and then the sentence hasn't ended. You keep it going. Uh, so you see paukis and you think, oh, it's ablative. Okay. You get a little C clause here, which means if, tibi, you have a dative. Uh, D is short for dei. But in poetry, you can syncopate these words to make sure that uh, you're not wasting syllables. And so you have here the nominative plural for, uh, for gods. And then uh, favent, a verb. Now, it's worth noting that uh, as you see that word, uh, it should activate in your head an expectation. Um, and that expectation is for a dative object. So as you hit the word favent, you are now thinking about tibia a little bit harder. Uh, maybe having a dative object uh, happen there um, as you were thinking about your dative through that clause. We end our clause there. You'll note that the ablative paukis uh, is met at the end of this line by an ablative diebus, which agrees and this is going to be a long arrow so let's kind of go up and over some stuff there uh all right so paukis diebus uh nice ablatives of time diebus of course not from the same word as d but from dies which means day so in a few days nice ablative of time there uh all right so um what I'll do is uh, we'll translate these two lines and then we'll continue on because this is a bit long so uh you will dine well my favolus at my house in a few days, paukis diebus, if the gods, nominative, if subject, favor you. If the gods favor you. All right, so we continue on. C starts another clause. Tecum is a preposition. Remember uh, what happens with cum. Uh, usually you say cum in an ablative. With personal pronouns, uh, you kind of tack them onto the beginning. It's easier to say tecum than it is to say cum te. Uh, same with nobis cum, vobis cum. Uh, make them, etc. Um, and so take home means with you. Uh, in this case, probably, uh, yeah, with you is fine. Uh, atuleris, uh, you might look at this word and say, oh, I don't know that word. But if you know your basic vocabulary, the tool is in there from ferro ferre tulilatus. I'll put that up in the corner just for fun. Uh, ferro ferre tulilatus. That's that. Tool right there in that third principal part, you put a prefix on it, at, and it means to bring or carry just like Pharaoh Ferre did. Um, and so your eris ending is a nice uh, perfect subjunctive. Uh, this tells you that the C clause is a certain kind of condition. Uh, it is a uh, present contrary to fact, uh, which means that you can actually get away a little bit with making this into uh, some kind of present tense translation as long as you use that subjunctive. You'll hear it when you uh, when you hear the clause, and you get bonam, aquae magnum, aquae of course means and. These two accusative ams uh, are are just sitting here, but they're both uh, adjectives, which means you kind of have to keep reading. And you see chenam, ah, there it is, right there. And so you see bonam, magnum, both going here to uh, chenam at the very end. 
Uh, you do notice, by the way, uh, that the atularis has an S ending, so your subject has already been accounted for in the Q uh, right there. Uh, non sine, not without. Tondida puella. Uh, so remember, with sine as a preposition, you expect an ablative. And you get one, candida puella. And then uh, a whole line uh, of polysyndeton. That's what polysyndeton, poly many. Syndeton means conjunction, many conjunctions. Uh, when you have more than two, like this and this and this and this, um, you uh, you get that effect of polysyndeton where it's just listing off things, okay? But you'll notice that the sine here with the ablative, uh, it takes more than one ablative because this et keeps that preposition going. And here you have, Ablative and ablative and ablative. Okay, so uh, what you're going to end up with uh, is something. Oh, okay. well, let's end our proposition. Uh, you're going to end up with uh, if you were to bring, you were to bring with you uh, good and great uh, food. Now, great means kind of like a quantity, like a large amount. Uh, good and great food. Uh, this food food uh, is actually more of a, a meal. This is this is the word for like dinner or meal. Probably not so much food. I apologize. Um, so if you were to bring with you good a good and great meal, uh, non sine not without a candida puella. A candida is an interesting word. It means bright or white. Um, the word candidate comes from this because candidates used to wear uh, very bright clothing, bright white togas, uh, and and show off, and so they can be seen in public. Um, so candida means like bright or white, going with puella, uh, calling her a, like a, like a, like a bright white girl, um, has to do with her class. Uh, this is not, uh, so much a racial thing as it is, um, kind of asking you to think about her as an aristocratic girl, uh, somebody with hot, good tastes, uh, hopefully, uh, yeah, so, so the, the idea is that, uh, she's, she's bright white, uh, in that she does not go out and like work in the fields. You know, tan, so you can see her class, her status, with the fact that she is bright white, uh, and of course, uh, not without uh, the like the kind of the bright white girl and the wine. Gotta bring some wine to the dinner party, and the solid. Solid means salt. Um, it doesn't actually mean uh, bring some salt. It means more bring your wit, your snarkiness. It's kind of a cool thing. So for good conversation, you're gonna want your wit. Okay, and uh, omnibus kekinis uh, and all the laughter. Right. Um, so uh, make sure you're, you're, you're in a joyful mood, right? So this is the beginning of the poem. It sounds pretty nice. However, it seems like Catullus is pretty much, you can, you can have dinner at my house, but I think it's very odd that uh, Fabolus, being the second person in this poem, is bringing most of the stuff. So I guess the next section, which uh, I will uh, get up here in a second, will explain uh, more of that. All right, and we're back. Um, I see in quam atulleris venuste noster, and avis bene. Nam tui catuli plenus saculus est aranearum, aranearum. Sed contra equipies meros amores, seu quid suavius elegantius ve est. Uh, it's pretty cool stuff. So here, um, you have hike. Hike, of course, at this point can be a uh, a lot of things. It could be a feminine singular nominative. It could be uh, a neuter plural. Uh, and usually hike is used as a neuter plural unless you've said something uh, feminine already. We could have maybe like think of it as the, the cana at this point. But um, my mind always goes to neuter plural when I see hike and unless I have some reason to, to think otherwise. Um, so it's going to be accusative or nominative plural. Uh, in the neuter, the C means if again, which signals you have to bracket. The reason I bracketed over here uh, is because in poetry, a lot of times in order to get the meter right, you have to kind of like, um, you have to kind of like squish the word inside the line a little bit. Um, so hike C in Guam. Um, but the C is close enough to the beginning where it, you can easily do that. It just like leaks over a little bit. And then in Guam is a, kind of an interjection, but it's a, actually a full verb. Uh, you might note your M ending here uh, being first person. So it's like I say, um, so it's a verb, but it's like not a verb. That's like the verb of the main clause. It's more of an interjection verb, like I say. And then we repeat the atularis from the uh, previous section that we just did. So atularis uh, is, of course, this um, this perfect active uh, subjunctive. 
with the S ending being second person, uh, going into our C clause here. So uh, again, we have that C clause. that's going to be another uh, present contrary to fact condition uh, because of a tuliris. And then venuste nos there, uh, we have, of course, our, our evocative again. Um, venuste nos there. Uh, and then uh, we repeat again, uh, cannabis bene, which we saw in the very first line of uh, the poem. Uh, nam tuli kotuli. Uh, well, so I'll just do a little bit of uh, uh, labeling here. So don't mind me. Uh, so you have again, you will dine well. Um, and then nam tuli kotuli, we have some genitives here. Uh, nam is like the word for indeed uh, or for if you want. So like for this happens or indeed this happens. Um, tuli kotuli being genitive, and uh, that genitive can't obviously modify anything behind it, so we have to go ahead and go to the next line and get the plenus, which is going to be nominative, but it's an adjective, so we uh, we can't get too excited quite yet. But then we see it's a succulus, the nominative, realize that agrees, and that also gives our genitive something to modify. Um, and then we get our est. So what I'm going to do now in my head is think, okay, so we had our adjective and our noun. It's possible that this adjective is, or sorry, the noun is the adjective. So uh, the succulus, which is a purse, a coin purse, uh, the purse is full. And then here, um, so in ecclesiastical Latin, you'll see full go with an ablative, full with something. Uh, in classical Latin, you'll also see that full of something. So you got your arm here, the other genitive. Um, so there you are. So uh, you end up having... Um, Hang on, there's, uh, let's, let's end that C clause over there. Uh, if uh, I say uh, you bring or you were to bring uh, these things, so we're going to make that accusative given our second person nature here. So, um, so if you were to bring these things, I say, uh, my dear man, uh, can obviously spend it. You will dine well for sure. Because if you bring the whole meal, I mean, who wouldn't dine well, right? Uh, for indeed, why isn't Catullus paying anything? Well, the coin purse of your Catullus, your dear Catullus, uh, asked, is full of spider webs. Arenearum, spider webs. Uh, and it, you could think of like the modern world, like in, a, in almost a cartoony sense. Like if you open something that hasn't been opened for years, you'll see a little cobweb up in the corner or something. Old spider web will be in there because spiders like to find the empty spaces and make their webs there. And so you can see Catullus is out of money. His 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 purse uh, is full of cobwebs, if you will. It's kind of funny. Um, said, but contra. Now, uh, usually this means like against or or something like that. But uh, we're talking about like a trade off. So like he's like I can't pay you. So contra here means more in return. Like think of it like as, as a trade. In return, akipies. Now, the E in akipies is important. You remember your A's and E's, 4's and 3's from the future tense. That's what you have here. Uh, and, of course, you still have your second person S. So we have our, our, our nominative covered in our heads. Check. We have an, a, sing, uh, a, a 2, a U. Um, you will receive in return, meros amores, pure love. My goodness. It's, a, it's a plural, of course, pure loves. But uh, we don't really say that in English so much, so we use singular. Uh, pure love. Oh, that's nice. But uh, it's kind of one of those things uh, where maybe you should pay somebody, but instead you kind of just promise them uh, like a smile or a hug. <laughs> so I don't know how fair that really is. Uh, say you, or, ah, here we go, or quid. Uh, so quid is kind of cool because it's kind of like a like an Ollie quid almost, but it almost starts a clause here. So maybe you, maybe you don't take it like Ollie quid if you don't want to in your head. I think of it as Ollie quid, but then the S doesn't seem to make sense unless you make it just quit itself. So, or it's kind of like a something which is. Uh, so something which is suavius and, or, or survey, uh, or elegant. But it's not just suave and elegant so much. The IUSs are, of course, your comparative neuters, okay? So this is actually, uh, or something that is more uh, sophisticated and, or elegant. Uh, so not just pure love, something a little bit more posh. Uh, Catullus will give you, you will, you will receive in return. And we're going to find out what that is after I erase and write a new section, the last section of the poem. And well, maybe we'll get a sense for what Catullus is really doing here. All right, so the last part here, we have non unguentum dabo, 
Cold me puella, donaurunt veneris cupidinesque, od tu cum o facies deus rogavis, potum ut te faciant fabule nasum. Kind of a joke at the end. We'll get to that in a little bit. All right, so we have nam here, uh, which means for or indeed. Uh, unguentum is a neuter noun. Um, that's important for uh, for us in a second. But uh, it is uh, still accusative, nonetheless. It could be nominative, but we see our dabo here. So we have I and then a future tense verb. Um, so, for I will give a perfume. Interesting. Um, now, the perfume, uh, like I said, is neuter singular, which means that this quote, if we're thinking about it either as because or which, is going to be which, which means that this has a role of a nominative or accusative in its own clause. And we'll get to that in a second. And uh, may I puellae, this is going to be a nice dative or genitive. Um, it could be nominative plural, but if he's talking about a girlfriend, uh, which is may I puellae, it's probably singular. So that's why I'm going with dative or genitive here. And then when you get to donarunt, it's a giving verb, and I'm thinking dative for sure. Uh, but donarunt is actually uh, donaverunt. It's a syncopated poetic form. Um, and so you see the erunt and you're thinking, ah, it's perfect active with the erunt and uh, dono donare means to give. Uh, and then you have veneres cupidinesque. Uh, you don't often see these guys in the plural, but they are venuses and cupids with these ESs. Uh, the NT there gives you uh, a sense that these are nominative since um, your accusative uh, quote up here can't fulfill that verb's plurality. And so we have quote is the accusative. These guys are nominative. And you move on. Uh, so you have four. I will give a perfume which the Venuses and Cupids have given to my girlfriend. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, another quote, as if to uh, to say, like, I hope you didn't forget, but we're still talking about the perfume, uh, which hopefully uh, is going to fulfill his uh, his his setup of something that is more suave and elegant than uh, pure love. Uh, apparently, this perfume is is our is is so good that it's it's going to be uh, fulfilling that expectation. Perhaps even better than money for all this food and stuff. Uh, so we have uh, which two is you nice nominative there. Whom ah maybe an ablative nope no ablative so it's going to be a clause. Uh, when, and then actually I'm going to do the same thing I did earlier. I think that we're going to take this two. We're going to take this two and include it in that cum clause. Okay. Because the two is going to be the subject of that S, but I think you can also, you can just as easily start it here and make the two go with that rogami. So it really doesn't matter for the bracketing. Um, so anyway, which when, uh, you smell it. Olfakies, uh, olfakies, uh, having to do with those sense of smell. That's that nice uh, second person word there. When you smell it, deus rogabis. Now, nice rogabis, the future tense. Again, we've seen a lot of bobi boo in this uh, in this past or in this poem. They ask, so you will ask, who will you ask? The gods. Now you'll ask the gods. The last line is kind of cool, um, but with the rogo rogare there, uh, then you come down here totum. Oot. So that rogo rogare plus oot, you know that your oot clause down here, you have more of that leakage there. That's going to be an indirect command. And the reason is you got your bossy verb asking, right? You ask the gods that they're going to do something. And when you ask the gods that they're going to do something, it's essentially you want them to do something. And therefore your oot clause becomes that indirect command. It is a bossy verb. So you have, uh, you will ask the gods that. Okay, now we have to kind of figure out what's going on here. So, kotum is accusative. Uh, te is also accusative. So, what we're going to do is make that agree with that. All of you. Totum u te. So, totum te. All of you. Fakiant. Okay, so actually, uh, we have a they here. I think that we're talking about the gods uh, because they're the most recent plural thing for us to have our NT with there. But, you know, if we're reading linearly, maybe we'll have a nominative coming, but, but we don't. So, we're going with the gods. They. They, the gods. Uh, Fakiant is, of course, a present subjunctive. Um, and that fulfills our clause expectation of having a subjunctive in the indirect command. Fabule, uh, back to our idea we've seen a few times in this poem that the uh, vocative is used for our friend here when we're talking to him. 
And of course, Nasum is another accusative. Uh, this is okay with Fakio because you can make somebody into something else. Does that make sense? So you can make Mimo a king. Uh, and Mimo and the king will be both accusative. And so you uh, you will ask the gods that they make all of you, Fabolus, a nose. What does that even mean? Well, if you think about this poem, let's 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 think about this. There's a perfume. It's amazing. Uh, the 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 Venuses and Cupids have given it to my girlfriend. Which, when you smell it, you'll want to be an entire nose. Like you'll want it to just absolutely like consume your entire being. That's how good it smells. Why are we doing this with this poem? Like, what is what is going on with this ending? There's a couple of things. Uh, this is less important for that question, but just so you know, the Venuses and the Cupids are representing, of course, like beautiful. Uh, trendy people. Those are the Venuses and Cupids, the people who are attractive and desirable in society. Like the best people for like recommending something trendy are the Venuses and the Cupids. That's who gave this perfume to my girlfriend. And therefore it must be great because they love it. Um, now here's the thing. When you smell it, it's so good that you'll want to be an entire nose. Now, um, in in uh, in the Roman world, uh, much like we say, you have like good taste. You use senses to talk about your your, your like how cultured you are. If you have a sense of taste, uh, in ancient Rome, they said that you have a nose for something if you can like. Uh, if you can sense that is a cultured thing. So if, if you like like good art, you'd say you have a nose for that in ancient Rome. And so this whole idea that he that you like that the you'll ask the gods to make you a, a complete nose is the idea that this perfume will make you so posh and sophisticated that like nobody will even doubt your taste. That's how awesome it is. Um and so it's it's pretty funny almost. It's a kind of a joke at the end here. Um, because it's exaggerating, obviously. Um, but anyway, I think it's this this whole poem, and this is this is kind of that, that last part I, I promised is what are we doing with this poem? Well, we have uh the sense that like Catullus is is completely out of money, and he's like he wants his friend to have this posh party at his house because even though he's out of money, he's still well connected and he wants to like still live this aristocratic urban life. Um, and so he's he's kind of uh, he's saying, like, oh, bring all the bring all the good stuff so that we can do that. All of the good food and the wine and the and the pretty girls and the and the laughter and the wit, of course, showing your education if you're witty, right? Uh, and all those aristocratic ideas. Poor people weren't like dining in such ways. Um, but uh, Cadell's like, but I'm out of money, so I can't do that. However, and then he goes into this like, look how look how posh I am. So what is this poem? This poem is an interesting uh, study of Roman urbanitas. The um, the the idea that like in the uh, the first century BC, um, which is when Catullus is living, uh, contemporary with Julius Caesar and Cicero and such, um, they've like they've kind of got this culture now in ancient Rome where the rich people uh, by this time are just uh, they're very they're very posh they're very cultured and elaborate with like Eastern ideals. It's less about farming and fighting like the like the traditional like uh, like Romans would be under like the in the Second Punic War the First Punic Wars and stuff like that. You get um, you get this weird lyric poetry in a Greek style, and it's all about like kind of the opposite of of the traditional Roman values. All of the posh things, all of the uh, the ways you can be sophisticated with culture and society. It's like in modern days if you're like into fashion and things. Uh, this is kind of the this this kind of poem, and it's kind of it's kind of a weird celebration of that. Even though Catella seems to be out of money in the moment. Um, he still seems to uh, to want to live that life, and I think this is a lighthearted poem. It's not supposed to be some kind of like uh, like criticism. It's not supposed to be anything other than maybe a a really kind of goofy, fancy uh, invitation to a friend. Um, and uh, his friend, of course, Fabolus. Not sure if he ever obliges because all we have is Catullus's book of poetry. But um, I like to imagine that uh, you're seeing kind of a trend with this poem in Rome as they expand the empire, you're starting to see the Greek influence coming into the literature, which, um, you know, the Romans probably would have not written something like this a hundred years before this. Uh, so it's it's a very interesting look at uh, how uh, 
globalization, I suppose, has, has influenced things. But uh, anyway, uh, that's the end of the video. Uh, if you have any questions, do email me or ask me if in class if you're taking my class. If you are um, somebody from a different school that I teach at, uh, you know, feel free to uh, you know to uh, to ask your teachers or ask another Latinist if you have any questions. Or if you can get a hold of me, I'm happy to answer your questions too. Thank you and farewell.